Okay. So the connection, I guess, is the fact that uh, many of you know many body physics. This is what you're basically interested in. And uh, we've learned now in the context of what we call quantum simulation to engineer artificial many body systems. And it would say that uh, using systems that we know from quantum optics, like uh, you know atoms, ions, and all of these things, photons, uh, that's, um, I would say, one of the probably best way of actually doing these things at the moment in the lab. So the great thing is that you can engineer quantum many body system and you can tailor them to what you want, not only realizing maybe interesting Hamiltonians where you know atoms interact in a certain way, how you write down theoretical models, uh, but I think it also opens a lot of possibility of engineering completely new models that maybe nature does not really provide by itself. And in addition, there's a sort of also an uh, underlying, you know, layer to all of these things. And this is really what theoretical quantum optics is about. You know, originally theoretical quantum optics started out by, you know, having light interacting maybe with atoms, generating, for example, a non-classical light like squeezing and all of these things. But today we understand quantum optics in this sense sort of in a more general context and in particular contains the theory of quantum noise and we will spend a lot of time here speaking about quantum noise and how to describe quantum noise in the particular context of what we do over here. Normally when people hear the word quantum noise in the context of quantum simulation or computing, they think that this is something very bad. Actually it's not, okay, in the sense that when we talk about measurements, how do we do measurements on the system? How do these things happen microscopically? How do we describe that we got atomic systems where we are scattering light and many, many photons, statistics of all of these photons and so on? Uh, and on the other hand, when you prepare your quantum system, for example, we always think about cooling systems to the ground state and so on, to very low temperatures. What we can do in these quantum simulators or these quantum optical systems is that we're using, for example, laser cooling, that we can cool systems and even also many body systems uh, to prepare pure states, basically zero entropy, zero temperature states. And so in this sense, quantum noise has also a very positive intonation behind all of that, okay? So my lectures here will be motivated by quantum computing and quantum simulation with atomic platform that's so successful at the moment. I give you the underlying layer of theoretical quantum optics. And in particular, we will then you know, have here four lectures. The first part today will be rather elementary, actually, because it is, you know, relatively simple. It's the problem of Hamiltonian engineering and quantum optical toolbox. I'll tell you and the take as an example trapped ions, how we engineer these Hamiltonians. And then in the second part, uh, hopefully it start actually today in the second lecture with that, will be on quantum noise and open quantum systems and very much trying to take minimal systems to illustrate to you how we can sort of uh, describe you know, quantum noise in the context of quantum optics is very much tailored to how these systems exist in the lab, okay? So uh, what I would like to teach you is this, that, you know, in quantum optics, there's a certain way that we think about quantum noise. It's very specific to how these um, models or how these experiments work. And I think once you sort of capture how you think about it in terms of quantum jumps, quantum trajectories, and all of these kind of things, once you think about this, this form, this and is an immediate sort of, you know, right way to get in touch with how these things happen in the real experiment. So in addition to this sort of lectures on theoretical quantum optics, I'll also be giving sort of more like a seminar uh, on these programmable quantum simulators where many of the tools here sort of come immediately, you know, as an application, but you don't really question them. You simply say, well, we know how to do measurements. We know how to engineer these Hamiltonians. Now let's go on. Okay, so there's a very clear-cut structure here. This is the underpinning of all of that, and then I'll show you in this special seminar then more like uh, sort of applications of all of that. So I'll do part of this thing now writing on the board over here, and part of these things I will present over here, but I have now a series of sort of beautiful slides as motivation at the very beginning. They should tell you the context, but then afterwards we start to do some very simple models that are quite elementary from a theoretical point of view, but they really point out, you know, how we can do this kind of engineering of interesting uh, system Hamiltonians uh, in a many-body context. Okay, so we wrote a few books about it. This is, of course, the advertisement part of the whole story. So a lot of things that I talk about are in a much more extensive way, in particular in this book uh, two up there with Crispin Gardner and the other one on, on quantum noise uh, down here. Okay, so motivation part, okay? So what we're interested in is engineered quantum many-body systems. And when I talk about quantum optical systems, what I have in mind is that we have, for example, atoms, like, for example, trapped ions here, 
or optical lattices. And you can see in all of these cases, we have here many, many atoms that are over here. Uh, also in optical lattices, in Rydberg arrays, polar molecules, maybe then also cavity QED with light. And these are, at the end of the day, engineered quantum many-body systems. And you can sort of uh, think about them in a way that you maybe dream up some Hamiltonian that you always found very interesting, uh, realizing an isolated system maybe, but maybe also a system coupled to a reservoir in the way that you prescribe, really that you fully specify what it is. And then you can ask yourself, can I realize these things immediately in the systems over here? Or maybe then even have some additional programmability on top of these things to do sort of when nature stops and being not friendly enough and realizing the Hamiltonian that you want, that you can engineer it in terms of maybe some quantum circuits and, and all of that. So this is sort of the setting. And now let me go through a few very elementary examples that illustrate how these things work in the lab. And then we are going to take trapped ions as sort of the model system and go step by step how we engineer these Hamiltonians and, and how they come out, okay? So some time ago, we we'll say the world was always sort of divided that we talk about quantum computing versus quantum simulation. Let me tell you the basic ingredients. What we do in quantum uh, computation is something like uh, we would like to implement on a quantum many-body system, which is here maybe a set of qubits, so spin one half, a general unitary transform uh, that we can always you know, uh, implement as a series of single qubit gates that act on a single spin one half system versus entangling gates and so on. So they always composite you know, out of these elementary building blocks. So when you think about building a quantum computer that sort of runs certain quantum algorithms, one of them might be what we call digital quantum simulation, where the time evolution through the gates that we have over here might mimic the time evolution of some many-body system that you specify. You know, we can always decompose it like, you can see that uh, the basic point of the game is now here, can we find physical systems to implement these things directly? And we have now many examples, you know, maybe you are familiar with the superconducting qubits, but uh, I'm coming from the atomic physics community where we take atoms that are stored in free space, like with light or in the case of ions over here, that we have some charged atoms, you know, and we can store them. You can see up there this row of atoms. We can store them in vacuum in free space, you know, and they will repel each other, but they're also confined. So this means that they form a Wigner crystal up there, these ions, and you cool them down to very low temperatures. And at the end of the day, and we will describe and go through this in all detail afterwards, you know, these trapped ions over here have, of course, ions that have internal degrees of freedom. These are the electrons, you know, in the atom. They can be spin up and spin down. And in this sense, you know, represent a spin one-half system or maybe the qubit that they have here for quantum computing. Then the question is, you know, how can we engineer in these systems? Now, interesting Hamiltonians that correspond to realizing, for example, a set of quantum gates that you have over here, you know, based on the natural atomic toolbox. And of course, we would like to do these things with very high fidelities because you would like to do maybe at the end do a long computation and even maybe at the end and things like error correction, what's really happening uh, at, at the moment, which is, uh, I think, very exciting. This is sort of one world, okay? I will afterwards take this example and tell you in detail, you know, how we go through these steps of engineering these kind of gates in the most elementary example, uh, which I know. And uh, second, there's sort of this other world this may be closer to condensed matter physics, and this is the one where we, we call this analog quantum simulation. Uh, you build systems in the lab, like for example, illustrated over here as atoms in optical lattices. What you do in this context is the following, that uh, if I take a single atom, and this is now for me a neutral atom that we have, you know, how can I hold this atom in free space? Uh, think about what we do, for example, with the tweezers that we have in biology, that we can take, you know, biological materials and cells and move them around in free space. You can do the same thing also with an atom. So having uh, a tweezer light, which is focused, you know, allows you to basically hold an atom and using laser cooling, you can cool these things down to very low temperatures. What we do now in optical lattices here, you know, I'm sort of explaining now still physics with my hands. Afterwards, we'll write some equations, of course. Uh, we have, for example, counter-propagating light waves, you know, and these counter-propagating light waves that you have over here, right in space, an intensity pattern, you know. And this intensity pattern is then seen by atoms as, as a potential. You know, it sees a periodic potential, very similar to the electrons 
that, uh, that are moving in, for example, a, a real solid, you know, they see a periodic potential, they form their block bands, they start to interact, and something very similar is happening now here, again, on this scale, that we write in space an optical potential, okay, and atoms are moving there. Of course, atoms have a huge mass relative to the electron. So all of the temperature scales that we talk about here are very much uh, you know, lower, we have to cool down to much lower temperatures to see the same phenomena that we would see in, in solid state physics. But at the same time, we can also see the opportunity here. If I go to solid state physics, my particles are very, very close. I mean, this is happening on the scale of angstrom, you know, what the typical distance is between this uh, distance between these this nuclei or atoms that constitute the solid. Uh, here, the great thing is that this is happening at a very microscopic uh, scale, or, well, not really microscopic, but, you know, uh, uh, nanometer scale. You know, if I take light, light has the scale of what an optical wavelength is, maybe a few hundred nanometers, something like that. And so this has the great thing that these atoms sort of move around. They can be fermions, they can also be bosons in an optical lattice, constituting something like, uh, say, uh, a Hubbard model. You know, that we know from solid state physics so well. And the good thing is that uh, the scale being so different, you know, scale that we, then we can really look at the, individ uh, uh, at the individual atoms and even take images of these individual atoms. And I try to indicate this over here by these snapshots. People have now what they call a quantum gas microscope, you know, where they can image the individual atoms on these lattice sites, you know, while they are undergoing the interactions. And this is a fantastic toolbox. You can engineer interesting Hamiltonians, but on the other hand, you can also sort of measure them in a way which is in solid state physics, you know, uh, uh, beyond what is, one is normally able to do in these real materials. So this sort of illustrates, you know, the flavor of what's going at the moment and how we engineer. And of course, this then gives hopefully then also rise at the end to, to, to see some new interesting physics that builds on these new opportunities that we have. Okay. Uh, to go now one step beyond, you know, uh, recent years have discussed something which is called programmable quantum simulator. So what do I mean by that? You know, I just showed you the Hubbard model is one example. Um, but let me show you other examples. Another example would be if I take a string of ions like the one that we have up there. You know, this is now again, I take my ions, I put them into an, a power trap, and they, I can store them like in a very unisotropic harmonic oscillator. Okay, when I put them in there, they will repel each other, you know, and they are at very low density, so they will form, this is a Coulomb repulsion, a Wigner crystal over here. Think of this just being a classical particle sitting at this particular point. If I'm able to cool them down, you know, to the motional ground state in this trap over here, uh, then these ions will be sort of like zero motion, quantum motion here. Uh, but then you can start to do your engineering tricks, and today we will learn that, for example, this system of ions over here, if you shine in lasers in the appropriate way, you get, for example, very naturally, you know, the icing model out. So each of these ions here represents a spin up and a spin down. You know, this is a spin one half for me. And what comes out in the whole story at the end of the day is that there's an easing model coming out. And it has the usual form of an easing xx over here. Interesting part is that it has a long-range interaction over here. And this long-range interaction is even tunable. You know, and this now represents in the lab an, an isolated quantum system uh, that we can prepare, that we can do quench dynamics on, and a lot of different things. I'll show you now a few illustrative examples now in, in, in one minute. Uh, and it is also tunable, so all of these parameters can be specified. This is realized very naturally in these kind of systems. Today we are going to learn how to be engineered these Hamiltonians and where these things are coming from, what the underlying physics is. Another very prominent example today would be engineer spin models and Hamiltonians that we do with these Rydberg trees arrays. You know, uh, that's a very exciting topic at the moment. Um, you take, again, you know, the tweezers I was talking about before, uh, and you can store atoms inside. You can cool them down to very low temperatures. Uh, but these uh, atoms typically have a distance from each other of about, say, 10 micrometer. That's pretty large. Okay, so the atoms sitting in this trap, they will not interact but we can make them interact artificially and even engineer this interaction by exciting these atoms to Rydberg states. Rydberg states that are huge, you know, quantum principle, quantum numbers, 50, maybe even 100 or something like that. So these atoms are then very large. And when they are very large, they see each other even over this large distance of 10 micrometers. This at the end of the day, if you go again, we are not going to do this now here, to the whole analysis, you can again see that we have now a spin model 
the atom can be in the ground state or in the Rydberg state, or in an alternative model, it can be two ground states, but you can make them interact by the Rydberg state. There will be a Van der Waals interaction over here. And this coefficient, C6 over here, that measures how strong the interaction is, amazingly in the systems and those scales like N, the principal quantum number, it goes to up to 100 or whatever, you know, to the power 11, okay? It's pretty large. So you can really turn on interactions that are very large, and you can engineer them. So you can engineer many body systems. These are sort of examples. So why do we call them programmable simulators? Because we can add things like, well, when the trapped iron uh, people do, for example, addressing and uh, for gates, they can shine lasers that dock to the single atoms. You know, not only observe them through the microscope, the single atoms, and say, atom, are you up and down when I do my measurement? But you can also do that, that you address them and maybe make rotations of your qubits and all of that. Okay, so this provides you with a toolbox where on one hand you have in the systems an icing model over here that uh, represents like an n-body interaction of an isolated system that we can you know, uh, Im uh, implement or engineer with very high precision and very high fidelity, plus then all of the operations I can manipulate the individual spin and rotate them if I want to, okay, together with the measurement. So this provides sort of a toolbox, it's a playground, where you can take your favorite problem in quantum statistical mechanics or condensed metaphysics and sort of uh, in the context of the model over here, try to imitate it and study it. And it's really great that these are isolated systems to a, a high degree of freedom. So just to conclude my sort of uh, overlook part over here, you can do these ions also in two dimensions over here, with a few hundred ions, and uh, maybe some of you have seen these uh, very exciting results by Misha Lukin now recently, in December, they did quantum error correction by taking the Rydberg trees arrays, moving atoms around and all of that. I think that this is sort of the forefront, what we see in the context of quantum computing right now. And uh, let me now, just mentioned that in the context of ions, you know, you can even buy these machines right now, you know, and uh, let me just show you what the numbers are. I mentioned before gate fidelities and so on, you know. When we say that we make an entangling gate operation on the pair of ions, uh, can we really do these things in the lab or are these sort of, you know, lousy gates that we are implementing? I find it quite amazing. This is from Quantinum, one of these companies that uh, is building now one of these trapped iron machines, 32 qubits, you know, and single qubit gate fidelity 99997. That's pretty good, though. Eh? Already, okay, and two uh, qubit gate fidelity is 998. I think that's the record at the moment. But it's sort of setting the stage a little bit that these things that I will talk about in the following, while being very elementary models on the theory side, you know. There's a lot of truth that these things can be really done with very high fidelity in the experiment, okay? And um, sort of to conclude my story, well, I always like to show from Rainer Platt in Innsbruck, with whom we are collaborating, a theorist, how this lab looks. Uh, and uh, let me now show you sort of uh, the, the transition from maybe things that you're interested in, like uh, many body systems, you got an isolated system over here that you prepare all of the spins, maybe a spin up, and you can study things like quench dynamics, and you might be interested in stuff like maybe thermalization, or as we will do in this special seminar, then also asking things about entanglement, you know, there will be a buildup of entanglement, you know, in this quench dynamics, and how can we measure all of that, you know, with the tools that we are going to develop now in the following. But even sort of, uh, these would be measurements over here. You can really see that these are picture taken of individual ions. We would simply say, are you ion up or down? Then it has to make a decision in the sense of a projective measurement. And if it's light or dark, you know, then uh, you can see that this corresponds to the measurement. We will afterwards ask ourselves, I mean, where does this come from microscopically? And uh, understand quantum jumps, the theory of quantum jumps, which underlies these things. So this is a question for quantum noise and quantum optics, how these things come about, and this is what we will do. And of course, you can also then do interesting other things like, well, we had now this very beautiful Hamiltonian. Maybe you put on your hat now as a quantum engineer and simply say that can be engineer interesting quantum gates, you know, or sort of whole quantum circuits that do something interesting. We'll play this game then afterwards, uh, for example, in the context of maybe some variational uh, algorithms and so on, you know, you can run a feedback loop between them. Uh, we'll speak about this thing. Or then also, and I'm, uh, this is stuff that we worked on uh, for the last few years, and uh, Pasquale has been a uh, part of this thing. He came up with the idea of the, of the member effect and trying to see in non-equilibrium dynamics 
that one would see certain phenomena that are related to uh, entanglement properties in the quench dynamics here. And uh, there's a toolbox on the atomic physics side that we can do that. So his idea could be realized in an experiment by taking uh, the theoretical ideas that we developed that correspond to the fact that you not only run an interesting quantum simulation at a certain point, you simply say stop, and now I'm making a complicated measurement, maybe by rotating my spin and looking at statistical correlations between them. And uh, just to indicate what the point is, if I'm making here a unitary, and I make this, take this unitary from a circular unitary ensemble, either on a global scale, or what we can do in the experiment much more easily is on the local scale, acting on individual qubits, then you can measure, of course, for each of these realizations of the unitary that they apply here, uh, you get certain probability for the statistics of the output uh, of the measurements, you know, being spin up and spin down. And then you can try to look at statistical cross correlations between these probabilities. And this gives you a lot of results like rainy entropies, entanglement uh, uh, probabilities, and all of these kind of things. And this uh, kind of a toolbox is available. And uh, we'll talk about then in this uh, special seminar about uh, some of these things that one is able to do over here. But after all of this sort of introduction, let me now come to the point where I would like to go over the iron trap is one example. I mean, I take it because I'm very familiar with that example. Uh, but illustrating how we do this Hamiltonian engineering now, and then in the uh, later lectures, what we will do is then that we do the, the corresponding engineering uh, of, the, of the quantum noise, and sort of trying to understand the underlying dissipative engineering that we're able to do uh, in many respects. Okay? So uh, the setting at the moment is now that we have now ions, charged particles, sitting in a very anisotropic harmonic oscillator, and they line up forming a Wigner crystal, and we are able to cool them down to very low temperature. How we cool down, we'll talk about this thing then a little bit later, but this is the starting point of our whole story. So how do we now think about this problem? Uh, but before I talk about that, just one more slide that uh, uh, you know, discusses the basic things of quantum gates. Uh, we will talk about single qubit gates in the following, that I take one of the ions, think of this like being the world line over here, being able to do any unitary rotation on the ion. Okay, this is what we call single qubit gate. And the two qubit gate is of course the big challenge, which is the you know, conditional to the state of one ion over here. You would like to perform then a certain unitary operation on the second one. We'll talk now how to do these things in, you know, in a setting that is uh, given by this uh, string of ions, you know, sitting in this harmonic oscillator that we're able to manipulate uh, by laser light. Okay? So, and now the story starts. And of course, when I talk about, uh, you know, many ions, let me start out by one ion and then we generalize to n. Okay? So, uh, if I write down my system over here, I would like to write down a Hamiltonian that I would physically draw in the way that I have over here. So think about now a single ion that I'm trapping in a harmonic oscillator free space. Uh, to be simple in the following, we just take uh, a one-dimensional model because this captures all of the physics that we want to do. So this is now a charged particle sitting in a harmonic oscillator, but it also has internal levels. You know, it has a ground state as an atom, but also an excited state, okay? So you can see that this ground to the excited state we can drive with the laser. So we have an external control parameter. This is my laser, which is now driving this atomic transition up here. But um, how do we couple now the external motion, which is the motion over here, to the internal dynamics? Well, the game in the following will be that we can control the external motion, or if you want, the phonons that we have over here, uh, with our laser based uh, on the fact that we got a recoil every time that you absorb a photon going from the ground to the excited state, the atom also gets a kick, namely the H bar K, which is the photon kick that you get from the, uh, from, from the, from the light absorption. Okay, so let's capture now all of these things and start to write down models. In writing down these models, we have to do it now, uh, we will do it now in two ways. There will be, first of all, a layer where we completely ignore any dissipation. Okay, this is what we're going to do right now. And everything becomes a control or sort of a quantum engineering problem, if you want to. Where we have an uh, internal atomic degrees of freedom. These are the ones where the electron is lifted from the ground to the excited state from the laser. 
and how this thing is coupled to the external motion via the recoil. And uh, what we're going to do right now is to talk about this part over here. This is now what we will do in the, in the later discussion, which is a much more complicated topic. And this is really where the quantum noise story is coming in and what we're doing. Okay. Okay, so we are finally at the point of writing down the minimal of all minimal models that we can invent in this case. And uh, the system that we are going to discuss here is now essentially this two-level atom and the one the harmonic oscillator. So to draw it again, we have here a ground state G, and this is an excited state E. This is for me now the following discussion an optical frequency. Does anybody know what an optical frequency typically has really as a frequency? Huh? 10 to the how many hertz? 14 hertz, quite a lot. Uh, 10 to the 14 hertz is the distance from here to over here, electron volt scale, if you want. And uh, we will call the atomic transition frequency omega eg. Now, we can drive this thing with a laser. What the laser does is basically will lift, you know, based on the quantity that we call omega, the Rabi frequency, you know, from the ground to the excited state in this electron. This interaction scale over here that's related to the intensity or square root of the intensity of the laser light is another parameter. And I want to emphasize right away that these uh, Rabi frequencies here typically are maybe megahertz, something like that scale, is much, much smaller than this optical frequency scale over here. And this will be very important how we will formulate our theory because uh, our models are really based on the fact that we will have a whole hierarchy of these different energy scales. And of course, there would also be a bad guy in the story that might be spontaneous emission gamma over here, okay, which at the moment we are going to exclude. We will describe these things and later on, this would be the coupling to this you know, uh, open quantum systems, degree of freedom. But we have this system over here, and this is now you know, tensor product with the motion that trap, and we will take here, you know, this would be zero, this would be one, we just write down here one dimensional oscillator. How do we now write down the Hamiltonian for this thing over here? Well, it's very elementary, you know, first of all, you would right away say that if I got my Hamiltonian for the trap, you know, this is harmonic oscillator, so there's something like center of mass motion, and m is the mass of my ion, plus the one half, and then mu, and then u squared, uh, x squared, this is the harmonic oscillator motion, elementary, you know, harmonic oscillator, there's nothing much behind it, that's the mass of the ion that we have over here. What are the typical frequencies here? Well, if I take a trapped ion, typical frequencies are maybe a megahertz, you know, maybe 100 kilohertz and so on. You can see that this frequency is roughly the same scale as these omegas that we have over here, you know, and maybe also the spontaneous emission rates that we have over here. So they are roughly sort of comparable here. And of course, we are also going to do this introducing A and A daggers like right over there to introduce just a harmonic oscillator. Amazingly, one is able to realize this, you know, with this exactly in this form in, in the lab with very high precision. So, what about now uh, Hamiltonian? So, all of you might know that an atom has many, many internal levels. But of course, what we can always do is that we can pick out pairs of these levels and we can connect them by selection rules, you know, and tuning our laser to the specific frequencies. So, we can talk we, that we can prepare and an experiment really two-level atoms, you know, as pairs of atomic levels over here. And uh, we will simply write the corresponding Hamiltonian. Well, if I call G and E, the ground and the excited state, this would be something like an H bar omega EG. And then there would simply be an EE, which is the projector. And I'm using the convention here that my ground state energy I put to zero. So this is just a, you know, spin one half system. And uh, this is proportional to the, to the sigma C. Finally, what about the interaction? Now it gets sort of a little bit more interesting between the ground and the excited state. If I ask you, you know, in a dipole approximation, an atom coupled to a light field, what the corresponding Hamiltonian would be, then you would immediately tell me, well, there's mu, mu being the dipole moment of the internal electron. So you got your proton over here, and you got your electron over here, and this is sort of the dipole moment. This is the one when you excite with the laser, is seen by the laser, it's trying to lift the electron up. You know, this is the mu over here. And then it's interacting, there's an uh, electric field over here, a uh, classical electric field over here. And then here, if we have to put the position, I uh, just write it the one dimensional of my center of mass motion. So center of mass motion, this is the internal electron that we are trying to lift. 
Now, in writing down the Hamiltonian, we are going to make the approximation that we are only keeping the two levels over here. And at the same time, we do something that we call the rotating wave approximation. And the rotating wave approximation essentially means the following, that in all of these terms that appear over here, you're trying to keep the ones that are basically, we call them energy conserving. And this is systematic in the sense of, you know, when omega is much less than omega g. This is the lowest order model in this context. Then we have something like, you know, there's a one half. Then there's an h bar omega. Omega now has to do with my light intensity that I'm shining in, or the electric field over here. And then we have here a part that if I have a running wave, you know, here's my laser uh, k, my wave vector, you know, multiplied by the x. And then there's an omega t over here. And then we would have something like, well, I'm going from the ground to the excited state. You can see when I go from the ground to the excited state, I'm absorbing a photon according to this Ravi frequency omega. This will be my momentum kick, and this is my frequency over here. So this is really the electron being lifted up to the excited state that you have over here, plus then the Hermitian conjugate, the whole story. Now, when you write down this model over here, you can immediately, this is part of the game that we play in the following, eliminate these optical frequencies. You can see that this is a frequency omega over here of our laser that's uh, 10 to the 14 hertz. These quantities over here, you know, omega, they are maybe 100 megahertz, maybe few megahertz, something like that. You can immediately go to what we say a rotating frame by making a unitary transformation that eliminates this thing here, while this thing over here will be replaced by what we call the detuning delta. You know, this is omega minus omega g. This is how much my laser that I'm putting in here, if this is my laser light, and I'm detuning it a certain delta over here. This is my detuning delta over here. Then, of course, the EE, -E, and at the same time that this thing is gone. So the bottom line of the story is that we have a very simple model. The model simply being the one over here that we can have now in this rotating frame. Center of mass motion, one-dimensional harmonic oscillator. We got the atom. Notice now there's a detuning delta that we have over here. We have here the Ravi frequency. This will be the momentum kick, and this is the transition from the excited state. And this is the fundamental inequality that, you know, the detuning omega nu are roughly the same order of magnitude, but by doing this approximation, we have eliminated all of these high frequency scales from the problem. So what does the model depend on? It only depends on three parameters, delta, omega, and nu. Okay, nothing more. So let's now move on and uh, start to become quantum engineers, because you can see the opportunity that we have now is here, that we can, uh, via the control of the laser, I uh, know, uh, control the motion of the ion, and this will be then the basis of doing, for example, quantum gates. So uh, I wrote down over here that uh, you might have, say, an, an atom in the ground state in a certain motional state, and if you act with the Hamiltonian H1, this is the one that we have over here, you can see that we have here now something like uh, we are in the ground state, then we have some motional state, you know, whatever this thing may be. Uh, and then via the H1, you know, what do we couple to? Well, this H1, we lift the electron to the excited state, but you can see this is a way of, at the same time, giving a kick to the motional state that we have over here. Uh, so we can engineer, you know, maybe motional degrees of freedom by playing around with the laser light that we have. Yeah? That's a recoil kick. Now, actually, this kick from the laser, you know, uh, turns out to be, can, we can simplify it in the following sense. If I take a typical optical light uh, wavelength, wavelength, a lambda L, I said this is a few hundred nanometers. If you go to these typical experimental settings that we have in all of these systems, uh, we have here a situation that these harmonic oscillators that we built, you know, we can ask what's the size of the ground set over here. The size of the ground state that you have, it's much less than the optical wavelength. So there's a small parameter in the story, which we call A0 divided by lambda L, you know, uh, we typically multiplied by 2 pi. But this also means that the kick that we have over here, e to the i k x, you know, that we have here, I can rewrite this in dimensionless units now as an e to the i eta, eta being this parameter over here, which I just said is now 0.1. And we can start expanding this exponential because it's small, 1 plus i eta, a dagger, and a, and uh, all of these additional terms. And now we are trying to give an interpretation to these individual terms that, that we have over here. This is called the Lambdicki expansion. And now let's try to put this together and then. Uh, we have here on the right hand side now this expansion of the laser interaction. You can see as a zero order term that we have there. 
And then as a, I'm not sure that this works. Okay. It's a zero order term over here, and now we can put all of these together and uh, have the following uh, elements. Namely, you can see, let's draw now and sort of do a spectroscopy of what we have. We got an atom, a two level atom coupled to a harmonic oscillator. So if you draw the energy levels, this is very similar to what we know in the case of a molecule. There will be the ground state of the atom and the motional state zero. And there will be the whole ladder going up here. There will be an atom in the ground state with phonon one, atom in the ground state, then phonon two, and so on, this whole ladder. And remember, the distance between them will be nu, the trap frequency, which maybe is, a, I don't know, a megahertz to say a number here at this point. Huh? And then we have the optical frequency above here, the same series for the excited state, where we have here an excited state that is zero, and then here an excited state which is one, and again, we go up this whole ladder over here. So there's a harmonic ladder down here, and there's a harmonic ladder here. So if you look at this expansion, you know, that we have on the right-hand side here, you can see that when we are shining in now light, uh, what's the coupling now like? I mean, uh, the first term up there, this is the zero order, will be the Rabi frequency, but this Rabi frequency times the projected GE that you can see up there does not change one of the quantum numbers down here. So if, for example, if I start out with a state over here, you know, what would I do if I lift up this atom you know, to, to the excited state according to this first term? There will be a resonance at the bare atom if I start scanning this laser giving with the strengths given by omega. But now look at the other terms that we have. We got this I omega eta, eta was small, times A. So there was a term over here, you know, that takes out one phonon. A was taking the destruction operator of a phonon, so I can take out one phonon from the system. And what's the process over here that I would see if I start scanning my laser, you know, I will see that I can lift up my atom to the excited state taking out one phonon in the system, and the corresponding strength of this interaction will be eta, so it's much smaller than the one over here. A times, well, and then this is A that destroyed this thing over here. And very similar, we get over here another one, which is now A in, uh, eta omega, and then here an A dagger. The A dagger will generate one, so you can put in phonons. So you can see that we are developing now a toolbox that allows us to subtract or add phonons to the whole system. And this is sort of the first step in this engineering, you know, uh, uh, game that, that we are playing. Okay, so based on that, you know, we have here what we call a red sideband and a blue sideband. In our case, in red and blue sidebands, you know, they are blue relative to the main line and red relative to the main line. Uh, they are the ones that would correspond to engineering or sort of, you know, playing around with the phone on degrees of freedom. Uh, I try to visualize these things down here, you know, the laser taking it up and seeing the bare atomic transition frequency, but then also having these phonon assisted frequencies over here. And notice one thing that if you go here to the ground state, you know, is there a red sideband over here? Is there a level? There is no state E minus one, okay? So you will uh, find an indicator in an experiment if you're cool to the ground state by simply saying, let me tune, do I see a red sideband? No, the asymmetry between the red and blue sideband is an indication of the fact how if you're in the ground state or not. And if you're in the ground state, you should not see a red sideband at that point, okay? Okay, so, uh, but we are now sort of at the step where we can now play the following trick. Uh, let me now take a system, okay, and again I'm drawing my ladder over here. You know, this is uh, states, ground state, excited states, these are the phonon degrees of freedom, and these are the internal atomic degrees of freedom. Suppose now I take a laser and I, uh, you know, tune it to my, what I call the red sideband over here. Uh, what is the model that would describe all of that? You know, just uh, the effective model there. It will be a model where on one hand we have here A dagger A, this is the trap. Then we have here this detuning, but uh, look at the term over there. This is now picking out the term that would correspond to the process that we identified over here is eta omega A, okay? So this means that the kind of Hamiltonians that we get over here are the ones that are given by H bar nu A dagger A. And then we get here the atomic part, but the important part will be over here that we get something like an no, I go from the ground to the excited state. 
I absorb a phonon. The strength of my coupling is eta times omega i plus emission conjugate over here. So we can see that by turning on lasers on and off, we can control phonon degrees of freedom in our system. We can try to become now an engineer controlling now phonon degrees of freedom here. And actually this model has a name, it's a James Cummings model. And uh, you know, maybe some of you are familiar with what's called cavity QED. You know, where we take an atom on an optical transition and we couple it to a cavity mode. The big challenge in this context in this model is always the fact that you would like to go to what is called a strong coupling limit, namely to couple this uh, single photon. This is a coupling of a single photon uh, coupling over here, so that a single photon drives the atom to the excited state to make this large. And this is experimentally very challenging because this goes like one over the cavity volume. This goes towards this nano photon uh, optics and all of that. In an iron trap, you get it for free almost because it just means that, well, you want the larger vacuum Rabi frequency, what would correspond to that? Just crank up your laser power. Okay, and it's usually much easier than to do engineering in this context. Of course, notice the difference that so this is an optical frequency down here, and up there we talk much more about sort of uh, uh, radio frequencies that are there. A uh, small side remark. How do we actually get atoms to the, to the ground state, you know, or to the emotional ground state? I just want to say, explain this by picture that we have over here, then we moved on. Suppose that you got the thermal state initially that you have over here and all of that. So this would be a thermal occupation down here. The intuition behind it is now a very simple one, and we're going to write this now later as a cooling master equation. Suppose that I, uh, you know, couple my laser over here to the red sideband. There will be spontaneous emission that dominantly goes down here. You can see right away that we will get here a process where any thermal excitation that you have in the system can be cleaned up, and where a thermal state row will be essentially can be cooled down to the uh, to the vacuum state or to the ground state of your harmonic oscillator. We'll talk later on when we talk about open systems, about all of that, also about quantum jumps and so on. Uh, but this means that we can prepare motional ground states in the systems. And now let's try to do uh, games over here. And uh, I want to give you now two examples. And uh, the example number three you will do as homework, as an engineering problem. Uh, and we do that as follows. And now we are almost on the way of trying to do quantum gates uh, you know, for our problem. Okay, so the first example that I would like to have here is this, that example of what number one will be that I would like to engineer in my single ion at the moment, uh, the problem of a single qubit gate. So what does a single qubit gate mean? I have my single ion, you know, in the, uh, put it into the ground state. So it is in a situation over here, you know, where we basically got some occupation over here. But this thing now representing my qubit, these two levels over here. How would I now you know, manipulate this thing without exciting any of the other levels over here? Well, I would simply tune my laser to this resonance over here and then apply this Rabi frequency for the corresponding amount of time. So just having a spin one half and by selecting the right frequencies, we can just you know, do the corresponding rotation over here and this will then do what's indicated here the right hand side, namely that any superposition you know, of the ground and uh, and the excited state can be, and the ion being in the ground state, you know, can be engineered into something which becomes any alpha prime, G, and then the beta prime over here, and then the E, while remaining in the ground state. This is very important that you're not heating it up or that you're not distributing the wave function over the larger uh, Hilbert space that you have here. So now let's do an example that's much more interesting because uh, suppose that you have initially a situation where I got a qubit which is stored in there in the internal degrees of freedom. So what does it mean to have a qubit in my internal degrees of freedom? This is now the example number two that we have over here. Suppose that I got a qubit over here and my qubit is such that I have alpha times g plus here a beta and then the e and I'm here now again, you know, Everything is in the ground state. So initially, I have some superposition of these two things here, but I have these additional levels over here. Can we do something, you know, which we could call a swap operation, where we take this qubit, you know, with unknown coefficients alpha and beta, in such a way that we can swap them over to our phonon modes, 
uh, in the sense of that what, what comes out here is the atom in the ground state. But we have written this thing now as a superposition, the same one, uh, now in, uh, involving the phonon degrees of freedom, like the one that we have over here. So this is like having an internal degree of freedom, you know, which is a superposition here. But you swap it now that the ion is now motion with exactly the same superposition that you had before the internal degrees of freedom. Well, it's actually very easy now for us to say what the answer is. Well, think of the uh, James Cummings Hamiltonian here. We just have to do the tune here to the red sideband. This has nothing over here, so this thing down here will just stay whatever it is. Whereas this thing over here, I can couple with the eta times omega, and I simply make now a rotation that brings all of that down to this thing over here by doing what we call uh, a pipe pulse. Okay, just leave this thing long enough. You can do it down here, and you get this superposition down here. So this is sort of the zero order exercise in doing quantum state engineering because we now can swap internal degrees of freedom to external degrees of freedom and, and vice versa. I give you now one problem, I know that maybe you want to solve as a homework problem, which is as follows, okay? Can you, in this problem, you know, engineer the most general quantum state that I'm writing down here in the following way that I specify to you, I would like, for whatever reason, you know, have here uh, a situation where I would like to use, starting from the ground state, I've laser cooled it, uh, my uh, toolbox so that I engineer the most general superposition state that I specify these coefficients Cn that you have up there, you know, and given the Cn that you have up there, you know, what is then uh, the pulse sequence of lasers and so on, the choice of frequencies that I have to apply in order to prepare the most general superposition state. I want to give you a hint behind it, you know, and giving you the hint is almost a solution, I guess, you know. It sort of works like this, that uh, imagine that I can do the opposite, that I have a known, known superposition of all of these states that are over here. Uh, suppose that I'm able to apply now pulses that clean up all of these populations and put it finally to the ground state. If I then do the reverse of this, uh, you know, unitary, then of course I have my answer, you know. So how would this work, okay? Well, Suppose that uh, I would like to get rid, you know, of this red uh, bullet out there, which is the highest uh, amplitude that we have there. What can we do? Well, we could apply, for example, a laser on the red sideband and transfer the complete population that we have there uh, to the excited state doing this cleanup. While doing that, of course, you have also excited, you know, in, this, uh, in the other excited states, you have also put population there that will remain uh, there, you know. But now you can do the following. Now you can sort of do it such knowing that we can apply a pulse over here to clean up this and you can sort of successively walk down here and clean up the whole thing. Maybe you try to write out the corresponding unitary, you know, that would generate in the sense of phonon engineering the most general phonon states in this 1D uh, oscillator that you would have. Uh, it's actually fun doing that, okay. Now we get a little bit more complicated and now we get really, I think, uh, we are at the point now of starting to do now engineering of many body systems. Uh, let's look at the most, um, sort of next most, uh, more complicated problem. And uh, this is the one of the many ion case. And I think that I'm sort of running out of, you no know, time over here. So should we make a break right now? Yes, okay. Yeah, let's make a short break and then continue, okay. Thank you. Okay, so now we come to the part of the story that makes it much more interesting. Namely, we talk about now N ions, and we are trying to engineer now many body systems. And you might wonder, I mean, how can we make ions, you know, interact with each other that are at a certain distance? We might be able to manipulate them with lasers independently, but how do we make them interact in the way that we want to? And the answer actually physically is a very simple one. Um, if you look at two ions, the example that I'm putting up there, and this is a very unisotropic oscillator, you have now two ions that repel each other, they sit in this oscillator, and now there are two ions sitting still like that. If I ask you, what are the eigen modes of two ions? Well, there will be a center of mass motion like that, the longitudinal motion, you know. There will be then also, for example, a, a motion which goes like this, you know, relative motion. And the point is now that if I just take these two motions and I work out what the corresponding frequencies are, 
One is the same, you know, center of mass motion of the, uh, of the original trap. And the other one, which goes like this, oscillates faster by a square root of the number of three. And if you do this thing for n ions, you do the same calculation, you find, well, it's always square root of three. So this is independent of the number n that you have over here, okay? So this means that uh, with our lasers, when we shine lasers on these ions, uh, by choosing the right frequency, I can say, oh, I want to talk to this sideband, or I want to talk to this one, and therefore you can control the motion of the ion, you know, which motion you talk about, center of mass versus relative motion, and all of that, by choosing the light ray uh, laser frequency and have this thing act for a certain amount of time. So in this sense, we can extend this notion, you know, of, uh, of phonon engineering that we did, a little bit unmotivated, I have to say, for the case of the single ion, in the many ion case now, but now it provides, as you will see now in the second, uh, a tool for engineering very general interactions between these ions. And the important point to realize here is this, that these modes that we talk about here are collective modes. So if I go to the first ion and I play the game that we had before, maybe I'm shining a laser pulse and say, oh, I would like to put one phonon in or one phonon out by tuning to the right frequency, you know, the new or square root of three, I can pick which mode I talk to and where I put my phonon. But notice that if one ion sort of, you know, puts a phonon in uh, because it's a collective mode, the other one will also see that, you know. So in some sense, the second ion knows what the first ion did, namely putting a phonon in their mode. So the magic behind this thing uh, is sort of that we have collective degrees of freedom uh, where these things actually talk to each other, which allows us then for some engineering interaction that we have. So let's play this game and notice that there will be different modes. Uh, there's these axial modes, the one that I've talked about over here. These are usually the soft modes with the lowest frequency, the one on the left that you can see here. There could also be, you know, uh, modes with much higher frequency that go like that in, in a trapped iron. You know, they are, we will use them, these radial modes or transverse modes afterwards to engineer quantum simulation model. And I told you before about this easing type interaction, one over R to the power alpha. We will use these modes in there. But I will show you there just a few uh, pictures or slides uh, indicating that. See, classical motion. Now we're going to use this quantum motion, okay? Over here. This is just getting by shaking the trap and then it does like that, okay? Now we want to control that on the, on the quantum level. So if I ask you to write down the Hamiltonian uh, for that, you know, it's almost trivial, or right? I mean, we have our two modes, A dagger uh, B, B dagger B. We have here, talk with the laser to the first ion, talk with the laser to the second ion over here. Uh, there's nothing, you know, special uh, that, that goes on over here. Uh, of course, what we want to do then is this, that let's re-express this uh, position operator of the first ion or of the second ion in terms of these A daggers and A over here. And now you can see that when we lift the electron from the, from the first atom to the excited state, we can talk to both the A and the B mode uh, here. And by choosing the right frequency, we can really select the A or the B mode uh, that we have over here. And this provides now a way of um, making ions interact. I want to illustrate this by uh, a quantum gate, you know. Uh, this is now the question, can I do a quantum gate in the sense of a controlled knob that I indicated before? So conditional of the first ion being in state zero or one, I would like to act with the rotation on the second ion over here. I can, in a very hand-waving way, explain this to now without writing down any equations, but we're going to use the following uh, setup over here. So I call the qubit now G and the long-lived state R0 up there. We're going to use a trick by having another level over here that is also long-lived. We will need that now in our argument, as we'll see in a minute. And then we have also other states in an atom that allow for state measurement. And uh, this is sort of what the real experiment would look, uh, you know, uh, it would have a qubit, calcium ions or whatever, bright states and so on. So all of these things exist. And if you ask yourself, are there many levels out there? This is the case and an ion. They can really choose any pair of these levels over here. So if I declare this thing here to be the qubit over here, then I can always use auxiliary levels over here. Okay, so things like this exist. But now, let me come to the point. So what I would like to do now is the following. That suppose that I have an ion chain and I've cooled it to the emotional ground state. Okay. How can we now entangle an ion over here with an ion over here, okay? Uh, of course, the first ion, you know, with this whole expansion, it is an entangled state, will be in a superposition of the ground and excited state representing the qubit, okay? And the second ion over here, you know, that we would like to act on conditional to the first being in the ground, the excited state, 
uh, will be, so the second ion over here will also be in some superposition. This is part of writing down this whole entangled states between the ions. What we can do now is the following, that I go to the first ion over here, and internally, I mean, I have now here two states that are indicated by this G0 and R0 that have cooled to the ground state, and this represents my qubit. Remember the example number one, or example number two that we did, where we said we can swap an internal state to the motion. We can do that also with a collective degree of freedom, and this is what we do over here. Namely, that we apply now a laser pulse here on the red sideband that takes out the internal degrees of freedom, and but converts this thing to a motion. So you got now a Schrodinger cat, if you want, that has internal entanglement, but the external motion is, if the first ion was in the ground state, uh, the uh, string will be not moving, will be at rest. And if the first, uh, if the ion here, the, this one I would like to condition operate on, will be in the most the excited state or the qubit state number one, uh, then I put the phonon mode in, so I got something where I got an ion and I made a Schrodinger cat out of these ions. That goes like that, okay? Just depending on the first one, you know, so if I swap this thing over, uh, internal superpositions are mapped to external superpositions. Okay? But now if I go to the, to the second ion over here, so this is the pi pulse over here that we did, okay? Suppose now that I go now to the ion number two that we have over here. This ion number two has its internal degree of freedom, which is a superposition of ground and excited state. But magically, the second ion now also sees what the qubit was in the first ion. Why? Because we wrote the qubit in the first ion into the phonon motion. Okay? So the second ion over here has an internal excitation, you know, which is my qubit, and it knows about the qubit from that we had before by moving. You know? So when I give you two qubits, you know, what's the Hilbert space? Two times two is four. Well, these are now the four states that correspond to these two qubits, but now the single ion knows about the qubit that the first ion had, you know? So we have now these four states over here. So how do we now perform a conditional operation where we take only one of these states and put a minus sign in front? Uh, I think all of you know that if I take a spin one-half system, and I take a spin one-half system and I rotate it to another state and then back, I accumulate a minus phase. Yeah? Well, if you know that. We're going to do the same trick over here. So how would I now, over here, this is again ground and excited state, you know, for the, for the ion N that is over there, which is now moving, you know, which is this dimension over here, which has internal degrees of freedom over here, so it knows about the original qubit. The original qubit is sort of stored over here, and this uh, original, uh, the, the original one, M, is stored over here, and the other one is, is sort of in this dimension up here. How do we now put the minus sign in front? Well, very easy, okay? We had this other level over here that we have in so many cases. So I can put on the red sideband over here and make a rotation where the ground state here would say, well, there is no state with quantum number minus one over here. So it simply stays where it is. But with this state over here, I can go up to this other state, make a spin rotation, come back, put a minus over here, okay? So I can basically do any engineering of a unitary that you would like to have. And now this whole thing has at this point, of course, the deeper meaning that if I go back to the first ion, I can take my phonon out again and restore it in my qubit. In this sense, I've done now here a quantum gate where I started all phonons in the ground state. At the end, we were using the phonon degrees of freedom to entangle, but at the end, we cleaned it up again, you know, and we did here a minus sign in front. This is a quantum gate that you need for universal quantum computing. It's probably the most simple example. The amazing thing is that this works well in experiments, you know, and there's different variants of all of that. These were sort of original demonstrations. You can see this was now 20 years ago, a very long time. Now one is much better than I showed you before. You know, examples that one is able to do now gates of this type with this fidelity of 99.98 or whatever these things are. You know, it's amazing that this works so well. Okay, so these are super simple models. What I would like to do now for the uh, remaining minutes over here is to go relatively quickly over some other ideas and I find some of them really, really cute from a physics point of view that are alternatives to what I describe over here. They're used in present experiments and these have to do with geometric uh, uh, or control gates, you know, where we are using geometric phases in order to make, for example, 
uh, entangling qubit gates. And I would like to tell you the tricks again in a very minimal model, you know, uh, in the same way that we sort of did this also here in the very elementary discussion. And then we're almost done because then I will show you how we can get the easing Hamiltonians. Uh, I'm sorry, you mean I missed the, the, your, your, your explanation, but how do you uh, make the Okay, uh, uh, in these experiments, I mean, this is technically what's called uh, actually a power trap. But uh, the bottom line is, think of these charged particles to repel each other, but they sit in a big unisotropic harmonic oscillator. So experimentalists are able to build, you know, uh, um, uh, unharmonic oscillators that are very open in one direction, but very stiff in the other direction. Okay, and this is underlying the whole discussion that we have here. Oh, yes, 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 yeah, yes. I mean, I showed you pictures, you know. This is exactly sort of, you know, oops. Uh. You know, these are very old pictures, you know. 30 years ago, 20 years ago, okay. You can see here individual ions. They sit like a Wigner crystal. At zero temperature, basically, almost, I would say, you know, in a very unisotropic harmonic oscillator. They repel each other, and they have all of these properties that we are talking here in this very elementary way, you know, with all of these eigenmodes. I mean, calculating these eigenmodes is like an exercise in classical mechanics, sorry, that you do, you know. Just write down the Coulomb potential, expand, find the eigenmodes, you know. So the amazing thing about this story is not the underlying theory here, which is elementary, but the fact that this works in the experiment in a fantastic way, you know. That's right, yes. Yeah. So that's why trapped ion quantum computing is sort of one of the ways of doing uh, yeah, quantum computing. Well, they move in a way, okay, so the way that I described it over here is this, and I say, we cool to the ground state and then we go on, okay? Uh, so this ground state cooling does not work perfectly, and I will actually describe now to you a gate where they allow to have a finite residual temperature. Okay, and this gate still works. Okay, the gate I described here is sensitive to the temperature. I'm going to describe you now a geometric gate based on using geometric phases, you know, that we write on the emotional wave function in order to get this kind of entanglement in a geometric gate, yeah? But all of these things work, okay? It's quite amazing. I mean, uh, you know, to say that this is my experimental friends that are able to do that. It's not me, you know, okay. He came up with some ideas, but it's really, you know, the great experiments that were done now since uh, uh, 25 years, you know, and that uh, we're able to achieve all of that. Okay. More questions here? Okay, so... We went over this very quickly, but maybe you can think about how to do this gate, and we could even have a discussion about some of these things. You know, how do we scale it up? You know, and uh, sort of uh, let me point out, you know, a certain wish list of you know, this gate I said before is very sensitive to temperature and all of that. So how can we get rid of it? And let me jump right away to something over here where I do a very simple model uh, that will use geometric phases in order to construct gates uh, that we have uh, in trapped ion quantum computing. And I think that the underlying physics is actually really cute. So it's just by this itself, you know, it's elementary mathematics will tell you, you know, that uh, this is cute and, and also useful. And gates done at the moment in experiments are kind of a variant of this. Uh, this is, for example, this uh, Wilbur Sørensen gate I wrote down a few you know, uh, references down here. So let me again go back to the most elementary model of um, thinking about motion in a harmonic oscillator, namely that I can an oscillate and I can drive it. So imagine that I have some control, you know, I can just kick it around in a way, you know. To some extent, what we did before, you know, with these Hamiltonians, we were, we were actually doing that. So depending on what my internal state is, I give it a kick, or kick is like applying a force to the whole story. So before we were basically doing exactly this thing here that we, by the internal degrees of freedom, giving, applying a force that basically was, you know, kicking the iron around. This was the whole game that we were doing. So let's now do the following story, namely that 
Let's write down a Hamiltonian, and the Hamiltonian will be in sort of natural units, if you want, you know, p squared plus x squared, uh, have this structure, and then I will have some external force that I'm able to control. And I just told you that we can control, actually, these forces by kicking the laser light, okay? So we have that available. Now, if I write down a phase space representation, you know, we have here an x and a p. Well, if you know, a harmonic oscillator corresponds to moving around in a circle. Huh? Um, and uh, what we are going to do now is this, that we are going to use the force f of two, f of t, to drive this thing around in a certain way in phase space. And in doing so, we will, at the end, accumulate geometric phases that we can use then for making entangling gates. So uh, phases first for the single oscillator, and then we will do it for the entangling gates. How does it work? Uh, so imagine that uh, I'm using a coherent state. Does, all, does everybody know what the coherent state is of a harmonic oscillator? Uh, OK, that's fine. So we have a coherent state of a harmonic oscillator. You know, a coherent state has as an argument here a complex number. This complex number is a real and imaginary part. And in phase space, you would, of course, represent this thing by a point that we have over there. So if I write down here a coherent state, uh, I can visualize the motion of what we're doing over here. You know, it's something like this. You would write then for this coherent state, these are classical amplitudes. C is now as a real part, imaginary part, that corresponds to the classical phase space. You know, this is the argument, the complex number that appears in the coherent state over here. And I can represent it over there. And you can see right away, if I don't have any force over here, this thing would simply correspond to this moving around on a circle and uh, would correspond to the dashed line, which is indicated over here. And if I have, uh, in addition to that, you know, a force f of t over here, well, it's just a driven harmonic oscillator that you do in elementary classical mechanics. But there's also in quantum mechanics, there's an additional feature, namely, uh, you will also, when you do this thing, accumulate a certain phase over here, okay? Uh, this is the difference between classical and quantum mechanics. And of course, if you write down the phase over here, it will obey an equation like that. So this means that the phase of the wave function will change. Now, most of you would say, well, why do I care about it? Because I will never see this phase. Well, we can make it observable by entangling this thing with an internal degree of freedom, which at the end is a trick of getting entanglement then in our system. So this is just classical mechanics that we have over here. So what we're going to do now is the following. Uh, we're going to apply now very special kind of forces, you know, in such a way that suppose that the ion was, uh, you know, oscillating like a free particle around over here. If the ion in a certain time tau goes from here to over here, uh, let's drive it in such a way that we drive it away with our force, but we choose these forces that drive it at a certain time tau just back to the point, you know, that was again on the circle. So at that point, you know, classically the particle does not know or see the difference, but quantum mechanically it will know because the accumulated phases will be different. Okay? That's a story. So we call this thing here the return condition. And now we can do the following. Suppose now that I go to a rotating frame where Descartes is this particle motion. Let me take it out. Okay, so I call this frame now x tilde that you have up there. Now you can see that what we do now is that uh, if you don't have any force at all, the particle would just be fixed at one point and sit there and do nothing. No? Whereas if you now apply a force in this rotating frame, it will basically via this return condition, you know, fulfill, uh, trace out a certain area. It will be an area that will be traced out, okay? But it returns to the same point. So the point is now that if you write down these equations, you know, the second equation is now in this rotating frame, you can see that it's only the force, you know, which is now driving the motion. And we drive it around then, you know, over here in phase space. If you work out what the change of the phases that you accumulate in your wave function when you go around, you will see that this phase, you just have to write these things out. This is using Green's theorem. And if you want, we can talk in the problem solving part about how this equation really comes about. You can see the important point is that the phase, you know, that you accumulate in this wave function when you drive it around, it's just equal to the area, uh, to the area that you have inside of this region that you were driving this particle around with. This is the most elementary example for a harmonic oscillator of geometric phases that we have. And so the question is now, can we use this phase over here to make a gate? But before we do that, let's see that uh, this kind of a manipulation has one property which is important, namely that these phases that we have over here 
are independent of the initial condition for the emotional states, and this makes it an independent of temperature. That's very important. Okay, so let's see how this comes about. Let's work out what the, what the phase is at time t. This is the one at the end will be the phase that entangles the ions, or it puts phases on. Okay, it's this expression, imaginary part of this thing over here. And now we had the solution before that for this C star, you know, in the rotating frame, we had an initial condition over here, and then we had something which was the second part over here. It turns out that this initial condition over here, via that what we call the return condition, that we go back to the same point, you know, it was exactly that, that we close our loop. This part is zero. This was exactly the return condition that we had on the previous slide. Okay? Exactly the condition. So this thing is zero. Notice that this part over here depends on the initial state. But by making this thing zero, we make this phase here independent of the initial condition. So I can start anywhere in phase space, okay, and uh, achieve that this is you know, independent of initial condition. But we get the second part over here. And this second part is actually the accumulated phase that I get by driving around. Okay, so you can see that we have something really great here. It's <laughs> trivial, but at the same time, really great that you know, we have here return condition eliminates the initial condition, uh, and the temperature dependence of this phase does not depend on the, on the initial condition. Okay, now let's, uh, these are sort of you know, plots indicating this thing, you not spend. So let's now make the problem useful, okay? Uh, useful in the following sense that. Uh, Let's go back to the fact that we said that we have an, an, an ion, you know, that has internal degrees of freedom. So it's really a spin one half coupled to the harmonic oscillator. Okay. So imagine now that I'm now in this larger Hilbert space where my Hamiltonian has now the center of mass degrees of freedom that are written over here, but I apply a force conditional to being in the internal state, in this case here, the state one. Okay. And using the tricks that we had here before, we can actually do that. Okay. So it means that I apply a force to the particle only if my ion is an internal state one. But I'm not applying this thing if I'm in the uh, internal state zero. So this means that if the ion is in a superposition of zero and one, you know, if I'm in the state one, I will walk around in phase space and accumulate my phase, whereas uh, the component of my wave function, which is uh, zero, will not get a phase. Okay. And this is now independent of the temperature of the motion that I have out there. So this means that we are able to do the following, that you can see any superposition of my ion initially, you know, I'm able to apply this operation and put any phase that I want over here. Okay. So is this useful? Well, it's very nice that this is independent of temperature and that the motion sort of factors out. So we made the temperature independent phase might say, well, you know, a single ion phase, do I care much about it? Can we make this thing an entangling gate? And um, it can be made an entangling gate. And this is so one of the first proposals uh, ever realized also in the experiment. If I have two ions and I do exactly, you know, this Hamiltonian over here, I feel the relative, the stretch motion, for example, which goes like that, okay? And suppose, and using our tricks, we can do that. I will not explain the details. We can apply a force that acts now on the collective motion, only on this one, by choosing the right frequency. We have sigma 1c and sigma 2c. These are the spin operators of my ion. So this is my Hamiltonian. Now you can see that if I have this Hamiltonian over here, sigma 1c, sigma 2c over here, it takes the role of the phi that we have in here, you know, this is a sigma c that we had up there, and this resulted in this phase. And this phase came from the fact that this appeared here twice. You know? So basically what you do in this whole thing is that you got the sigma 1c and the sigma 2c, you know, the sigma 1c and then the two sigma 2c. What this last term over here does, it basically squares this thing, and you can see if I multiply it out, of course I get the sigma 1 square, which is 1, sigma 2 square, which is 1, but I also get a cross term, sigma 1c, sigma 2c. So I can convert these ideas into entangling gates between two ions that are independent of temperature. That's the most simple example of uh, 
engineering, you no know, interactions that are uh, independent of temperature. Ah, okay. Uh, good question. Yeah. So the coherent state is like this. So I take initially, uh, I've prepared, for example, I don't know, maybe I've done cooling, but I've not done a perfect job. I got the thermal uh, equilibrium state as an example. So I got the thermal state over here, you know, which is a thermal state, which will be something like an e to the minus beta, and then would be an a dagger a to write something down over here. I can always expand any density operator that over here, um, almost any, I would say, you know, in terms of a global representation of coherent states. If these are my coherent states, and this is the P of alpha that I have over here, I can always expand it like that. So uh, coherent states are overcomplete states, and uh, in this diagonal, you know, so density operators like this can always be represented. So basically what I do is this, that I pick out one alpha from this, and sort of, you know, I can move it inside and then move it out again. So uh, linearity of quantum mechanics, okay, yeah, okay. More questions? It's a good question, yeah. Okay, so uh, we have made gates now. They are independent you know, of temperatures, and this is sort of great. Uh, here were some experimental realizations, and you go, can move on to now uh, n atoms, and you know, we can start to write down all of these equations. You can see that in the case of n atoms, if you write down the unitary time evolution operators, you may be not surprised that you got something like a sigma c i, sigma c j, and there's some coefficients in front that you can engineer, and these coefficients are given by some integrals. Then it's up to you to decide sort of you know, what, we, what we want. I think I didn't write down the equation over here. So there's certain expressions for this j or j that come out over here. The trick is always the same, okay? So now it comes down to the point, suppose that you would like to apply to ions, the general transformation where you specify that j or j is a matrix, then you can do some sort of a coherent control problem where you say, what kind of forces and laser biases do I have to apply in order to achieve that? And uh, people have looked at that. It's a little bit tedious, but I think conceptually it's pretty clear what's going on. Let's now sort of, as the last part of the story here with this quantum simulation, uh, switch over to quantum simulation, okay? Because remember the very beginning I told you, and this sort of closes my simple exercises here in quantum engineering for these uh, trapped ions. Uh, we have said at the very beginning that we have a string of trapped ions, and I told you at the end, if you go through all of these things, what comes out is an easing model with long-range interactions. Okay, this was my claim. And there's even some possibility of manipulating this thing. So how does this thing come out from this kind of a formalism over here? And I would like to show you this, I love showing some beautiful pictures over here, basically. Uh, using just these ideas, how this thing emerges, and I got some of these slides from Christian Rose who gave them to me. So this is trapped ion simulation now, and now we're doing something different in the, in the following sense. So this is the picture I showed you before. How do we get this Hamiltonian from the formalism that we just discussed right now from this physics, okay? Uh, so when you have a string of ions over here, I told you before, there will be longitudinal motion, they go like this, like the center of motion, but it will also be a much faster motion that goes like that, you know, and maybe also then things like that. So there will be all of these modes that are sort of trivial, calculated by classical mechanics, and they're illustrated over here as these axial modes and transverse modes that they have over here. Now we are going to use these modes over here, and uh, you no, know, while before we were playing these tricks that we tuned the laser always resonantly, you know, to these individual modes to manipulate them, now we are going to use a laser where we, that we tune off resonance to that. So we have now lasers that come, here's the ion string, come from the side in an appropriate way, and they are now off resonant with respect to these modes, and if you go through the whole calculation, I just want to show you now some plot what emerges as these effective interactions. This is a you know, a red sideband on the left for this transverse motion. This is the blue sideband on the right, exactly as we talked about here before. And... Uh, put the laser over here, and another laser over here, and uh, this will sort of cost, and if you go through the whole calculation, this at the end will then lead to an interaction matrix over here. Just doing the calculation that we did, but it's a little bit tedious, but in principle it's straightforward it's over here. So what's the outcome now? I can take now this matrix J or J, I can write it as a superposition of these eigenmodes, and now you can ask, 
which of these many you know, modes that you have over here will now make what contribution to this JIJ matrix. So does this give me some engineering possibilities, you know, to engineer interesting spin models. And, uh, you know, so here are some examples of the different contributions. So if you take the center of mass motion, you know, in this transverse direction, uh, and tilt and all of this, you can see that you're building up here basically completely different patterns of this matrix that you can all superimpose. And at the end, what comes out of the whole story is that if you sum all of these things up, it is a very good approximation given by this J0 divided by distance to the power alpha. And alpha is a tunable parameter that I can play around with by tuning my laser closer or a little bit further away and so on. I mean, I'm waving my hands over here, but I think it's pretty clear based on the toolbox that we had. We can do this calculation in principle and uh, uh, this works in the lab. And Christian Rose, you know, has done these things. Uh, one example here with, uh, in 2D ions. So this was the example I showed you before. So this is sort of the result of the story. And this now closes for me the story of this Hamiltonian engineering. I really went through very elementary Hamiltonians. They always sort of convert spin to phonons. And phonons are collective. And we play around with them at the end, getting uh, simulation Hamiltonians out that we, for our many body system, or that we can use for a quantum computing, like making gates. Okay? This was elementary quantum mechanics, sorry, wasn't it? The amazing thing is it works in the lab. Okay? And uh, I think I have a little bit time left now here. So, should we start with the second? I have now the part where I really would like to switch over to talk about quantum noise. I mean, now the story changes from this elementary quantum mechanics to something that's becoming a little bit more interesting from my perspective also, or theoretically challenging or interesting. We talk about quantum stochastic Schrodinger equations, you know, in principle on the, uh, you know, this is underlying mathematics, which is then quantum Ito calculus and all of that. We will sort of do a, um, poor man's derivation of some of these things, but in a way that hopefully will show you or demonstrate you how people in quantum optics, like I am, you know, think about quantum noise. And I think that this, how we think about quantum noise, that this is sort of really the main message behind it, and this is what I would like to do. So I have a few slides here that I, uh, oops. I think I have to stop the screen sharing here. We're sort of close to the end now, anyway. Why don't we start afresh then on Friday morning? And this will be then the lecture. So on quantum noise, quantum stochastic Schrodinger equations, and all of these things, quantum jumps, quantum trajectories, and how we derive it, how we think about it. Because this is really sort of the guiding principle for us, how we you know think about physical systems. And it's very much motivated by hierarchy of energy scales, like optical versus rotating wave, and what is white noise in our context, and so on. Okay? So then, uh, tomorrow I will give a seminar that, uh, seminar style that talks about application of some of these things, you know, the last time I done and I showed you, and uh, talking about some, you know, for example, how to measure rainy entropies with these protocols that we have here, stuff like that. And on Friday we do a quantum noise session for advanced uh, quantum opticians, okay?